Good morning, Revolution Church. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning. Uh, hey, my name is Brandon. If you don't know me, I am the student pastor here. And I got to say, it is an honor and a privilege uh, to be preaching this morning. It's not an honor and a privilege that I take lightly. I'm extremely grateful. Uh, yes, you came on a youth pastor preaching Sunday. And no, you can't leave. It's too late. If you leave now, you're going to look like a total jerk. So you're stuck with me for like the next 30 minutes or so. But there is good news, and the good news is that I've been praying all week that God would do 100% of the speaking this morning because I all have nothing to give, but God has absolutely everything to give. Um, and I really believe that he has given me a message this morning that is going to be good for all of us. Um, so I want to start this morning by asking a question, and that is, does anyone here have any embarrassing moments in their life? Any moments in their life that they look back on and they just cringe about? Me too. Me too. In fact, I think I have more embarrassing moments than the average person does. Uh, and I want to share with you uh, probably my most embarrassing moment this morning. Now, you should feel honored that I'm sharing this with you. It took me like three years to build the courage to share this with my students. So my students have heard this, uh, and I'm going to share it with you guys this morning. Um, um, so I need you to imagine uh, high school Brandon, because I'm in high school when this is taking place, and uh, there's this kid in my class whose mother tragically passes away, suddenly passes away. It's awful. And he has to leave school for like an entire month. And when he comes back, I remember I met with him, I sat down with him, and I was like, hey, man, how you doing? And we talked for a little while. And eventually the conversation got a little bit more casual, you know, and he started telling me the things that he did over the month that he was out. He said, yeah, I actually did a lot of hunting because I'm from South Georgia and being in the woods and hunting, uh, it's a lot like therapy. And he said, I did a lot of hog hunting. And uh, I said, hey, did you get anything? And he said, yeah, I got a couple, but I also saw one that I missed and Brandon, this was hands down the biggest pig I have ever seen in my entire life. Now, I need to hit the pause button on this story for a second and give you some context. This was like 2007, 2008. And if you remember 2007, 2008, then you know that back in those days, yo mama jokes were super popular. And you lived for the perfect opportunity for, the, for a good yo mama joke. You were constantly on the lookout for the perfect setup for a great yo mama joke. And so when he said... When he said, I saw the biggest pig I've ever seen in my entire life, everything else about the situation just faded away. I completely forgot that this guy's mother just died a month ago. All I was focused on was this incredible setup that he gave me. And so he said, I saw the biggest pig I've ever seen in my entire life. And I said, you want to know the biggest pig I've ever seen in my entire life? Yo, mama. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> like, as soon as the words left my mouth, it's like one of those moments where the, you can see the words leaving your mouth, and you try to grab them, but you can't. And I remember just seeing the look of pain and, and heartbreak on this kid's face when he heard me, and I felt so terrible, so terrible. And, uh, man, I was apologizing to him for the rest of the day, for the rest of the week, for the rest of the school year. I was apologizing to this kid. And you know, for the longest time, for the longest time, whenever I'd hear a yo mama joke or even see a pig, I would be reminded of this moment. And, and every time that I was reminded of it, it would hurt. It would stop me in my tracks, and I would travel back in time and relive it. You know, there's this, uh, there's this movie from the 80s, which is hands down one of my favorite movies ever, and it's called Back to the Future. Um, if you don't know, Back to the Future is about this teenager named Marty McFly who for some reason that's never explained is best friends with this old scientist. And this scientist invents a time machine out of a DeLorean. And Marty McFly gets in the time machine, goes back in time, and he's always getting himself in trouble in the past and he's always trying to get back to the future. Well, for the longest time, any time that I would hear your mama joke, it was like I was Marty McFly in the time-traveling DeLorean, traveling back in time, right back to that very moment that I regretted so much, and it would hurt. All that, all that guilt and all that shame and all that embarrassment would just come flooding back. But I have found freedom from that. That's why I can share this with you today. I can now hear your mama joke and not feel guilt. I can now look at a pig and not feel that shame or embarrassment. I have found freedom from that mistake in my past. And this morning, I'm going to tell you how I did that and how you can do that too, because I'm willing to bet that there's a lot of people here right now who can relate to me in that they have things in their life that they just can't seem to get past. They just can't seem to get over. Like you'll see something and it will take you back in time and you'll relive the moment and all that guilt and all that shame or pain or, or temptation or whatever will just come flooding back in. Now this is a common problem. And this is a common battle that most people face. This is a common condition. And it's a condition that I'm calling yesterday-itis, okay? It's a condition where we just can't seem to move on. We just can't seem to get over our yesterdays. And y'all, it's so important. It is so important that we find freedom from our past, freedom from our yesterdays, healing from our yesterday-itis. It's so important that we find that freedom and find that healing because, y'all, we have an enemy. We have a very real enemy who will sniff out this weakness in us. He will sniff out this condition, and he will use it against us every single chance that he gets. Because we're in this series, y'all, called Spiritual Warfare, and we're talking about our very real enemy that the Bible uses the title Satan to refer to. Now, Satan is not a name. Satan is a title. Anytime that you see the word Satan in the Bible, it's actually the Satan, ha-satan, which means the adversary. Another way you could put this is the opposer. Now, there's a lot of gray area on exactly who this Satan is and probably most of the stuff that you've seen in movies and TV shows and heard of music or whatever. That's probably mostly wrong. Uh, there's a lot of gray area on who he is, but what we do know is that he is very real, and we do know that he exists to oppose you. He exists to oppose people from meeting Jesus, and he exists to oppose people from following Jesus. See, I believe that every single follower of Christ has the potential to change this world. Why do I believe that? Because of verses like Romans 8, 11, which should magically appear right in front of my face. It says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in who? Lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within who? Living within you. Y'all, this is absolutely incredible. The spirit of God, the spirit of the one who created the universe, who created everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever known, the spirit of God is living in you. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you put your trust in Jesus, if you put your trust in Jesus, y'all, you have world-changing potential inside of you. And God has a plan to use you, y'all, to do incredible, mind-blowing things with your life. But Satan, y'all, is the opposer, and he exists to stop you from reaching that full potential that's in you. 
He exists to oppose you from doing all that God has called you to do with your life. So in this series, we're talking about the different ways that we have seen Satan do this. In this series, we're talking about the different strategies that we've seen Satan use to oppose people from following Jesus and to oppose people from walking into God's plan for their lives. And this morning, we're talking about one of the main ways that he does this. One of the main ways that I've personally seen him do this, and that is by using the back to the future method. See, what he does is he, he loves to put us into time-traveling DeLoreans. He loves to place reminders in front of us that transport us back in time. And you may be asking, why does he care so much about transporting us back in time? Because listen, y'all, this is important. If the enemy can keep you in your sinful past, then he can keep you from your glorious future. If the enemy can keep you living in your past full of sin, he can keep you living, he can keep you from living in your glorious future with all the incredible mind-blowing things that God has called you to do with your life. If he can keep us in our sinful past, he can keep us from our glorious future. Now, I've got other DeLoreans in my life other than yo mama jokes and pigs. I've got other sinful mistakes. In other words, I've got other regrets. I've got other things I've done in my life that Satan has tried his best to remind me of, but they're just not as as funny. Maybe y'all can relate. Maybe y'all have mistakes, sins, failures that the enemy tries to remind you of. Maybe y'all have mistakes that the enemy tries to bring you back in time and make you relive to bring that, bring that guilt and that shame back up. Because the enemy knows, y'all, that guilt is like spiritual coffee. It stunts your spiritual growth. So he tries to keep you in your past to keep you from your future and to keep you full of that spiritually stunting coffee. <laughs> Let me give you an example. Maybe, uh, maybe you've got a past with alcohol and you really struggled with alcohol, and you did a lot of stupid things when you were drunk. Now, maybe you've moved on, and maybe you've asked God for forgiveness. And listen to me, he has forgiven you if you've asked him. And maybe you're trying to get your life back on track, but here's the thing. You can't go grocery shopping anymore because you can't walk past the liquor aisle without feeling all that guilt and all that pain and that temptation come flooding back into your mind and into your heart. Why is this, y'all? Because you have a case of yesterday-itis. You have found forgiveness from God from your yesterdays, but you haven't found freedom from your yesterdays. And y'all, the enemy will use this against you every single chance that he gets. He will find a way to put you in situations where you are tempted and reminded of the past. And he'll use something as simple and innocent as going to the grocery store as a DeLorean to travel you back in time. The enemy uses it to bring you back in time. He uses it to bring that guilt back up in your hearts. Here's another example. Maybe you went through a nasty divorce, and you've got a lot of pain and guilt and shame and embarrassment and frustration and anger about the divorce that you went through. You know, I've actually heard stories. I know of people that have came to this church, came to Revolution Church after going through a nasty divorce, and they're ready to get their lives back on track. They're ready to follow Jesus. They're ready to walk in the plan and walk in the purpose that God has for their lives. And they're doing great for a little while, but then for some reason, strangely, who walks in the door one Sunday? Their ex. And they see their ex, and all that guilt, and all that shame, and all that pain, and all that anger comes flooding back, and it sends them away, sends them straight out the door, and they never come back. The enemy used it against them, and he succeeded. Y'all, the enemy will put time-traveling DeLoreans in your path every chance he gets to stop you from walking in the path that God has laid out for you. And if you have not found freedom from your yesterdays, if you've not found freedom, he will use it against you every chance he gets. Listen to me, guys. If you are in Christ Jesus, the sin that you've committed in the past, the sin that you commit today, and the sin that you'll commit tomorrow, it's been paid for. You are a new creation. The sin is dead and gone. If you have put your trust in Jesus, y'all, listen to me, you are forgiven. The sin is gone, but here's the thing, the memories aren't. 
Maybe the sin is gone, but the shame is still there. The sin is gone, but the guilt is still there. The pain is still there. The anger is still there. The temptation is still there. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the enemy will use that against you every single chance he gets. You can count on the enemy using that against you to make sure you will never walk into God's full plan for your life. The enemy knows you. He studies you. And if you haven't found freedom from your yesterdays, he knows it. And he will do all you can, all he can to keep you from ever finding that freedom. The enemy will try his best to make you live in that guilt to keep you from growing spiritually. Now, I want to prove this to you. I want to prove this to you because it's really important that you understand this truth. So I want to prove this to you by reading about two different dudes from Scripture. Two different guys, two different stories in Scripture. But before we get into the first guy's story, let me just say, if you think the Bible is boring, y'all, you've got some issues, okay? It's literally got everything you could ever want. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, well, you need to repent and stop watching Game of Thrones, but it's got everything you could want. If you're a Jerry Springer fan, yeah, you probably shouldn't watch it. You need to repent, but it's got everything you could want. It's got drama. It's got action. It's got war. It's got romance. It's got everything in it, and you're going to see that in this story that I'm fixing to tell you, but this story is about a guy named David. Now, you don't have to uh, grow up in church to know who David is. Uh, I'm talking about David as in the David from David and Goliath. You know, David, everybody knows about this guy named David, right? David has an incredible past of being used by God. He was this teenage boy who God used to kill a giant that had an entire nation's army peeing their pants. He, he was a mighty warrior. In fact, he's one of the mightiest warriors that we see in Scripture, he was used by God to take the throne from a corrupted king, and he did it in such a God-honoring way. It's incredible how, how David was used by God. In fact, the Bible calls David a man after God's own hearts. That's who David was. But then something happens in David's life. Then he makes a big mistake. And I'm going to read to you about this mistake. This is 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 17. It says, in the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab, <clears throat> who, by the way, was the commander of David's army, and, and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So David was supposed to go out to war, but he was being lazy. And as a result, he, he didn't go. And as a result, he was hanging out at his house. And as a result, he was bored. And y'all, you know what happens when you're bored. Late one afternoon, after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And he looked out over the city and he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. So David is walking on his roof. And, and he, looks to, he looks over and he sees this woman bathing. Now, he's not blind, so of course he saw this woman. But he's a man after God's own heart, so he's probably like, oh, I, I'm not going to look at her. I'm not going to lust after her. But then what happens is he takes a second look, and he's overcome with lust. And what he does is he, he sends someone over to find out this girl's situation. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam. Okay, cool, gotcha. But then he hears she is also the wife of Uriah the Hittite. She's, she's married. So this man after God's own heart is probably like, oh, she's married, she's taken. Okay, eh, I'm done. I'm not going to pursue this any further. No, that's not what happens. What happens is David sent messengers to get her. And she came to the palace and he slept with her. You realize what happened here, guys? David, David raped this woman. She had no choice but to have sex with David. David was king. She had to do whatever he said. He raped this girl. Let's continue. She had just completed the purification rites after having her menstrual period. I don't know why that's in there. Don't ask me. We're just going to ignore it. But then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, <gasps> She sent David a message saying, hey, I'm pregnant and you my baby daddy. And then David sent word to Joab, the commander of his army, and said, hey, send me Uriah the Hittite, who was Bathsheba's husband. So Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah arrived, David asked him, David asked him hey, how, how's Joab and the army going along? 
And how's the war progressing? And then he told Uriah, hey, listen, buddy. Hey, go home, relax. David even sent a gift to Uriah after he had left the palace, but Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So I don't know if you guys caught what's happening here, but David's trying to cover up his mistake, trying to cover up his sin. So what, he's, what his plan is, is to get Bathsheba's husband to come home and send him to his house and after a long, uh, tiring uh, time of being out at war and say, hey, maybe Uriah will go home and sleep with his wife. So then when Bathsheba uh, is noticeably pregnant, Uriah is going to think it's his child and David will get off scot-free. That's David's plan. But we'll see it's not going to work out that way. When David heard that Uriah had not gone home, he summoned him and asked, Hey, what's the matter? Why didn't you go home last night after being away for so long? Listen to what Uriah says. He says, The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah are living in tents, and Joab and my master's men are camping in the open fields. How can I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? I swear that I would never do such a thing. That's how loyal this guy was to to God and to David and to the army. Well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that next day and the next. And then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So the next morning... And by the way, this is where David really, really screwed. He screwed up a lot already, but he's about to go even further because he couldn't get Uriah to go home. So this man after God's own heart will probably be like, okay, um, well, this plan isn't working, so I guess I'm going to own up to my my mistake, and uh, we're just going to get this over with. No, that's not what happens. This is what happens. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, hey, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest, and then pull back so that he will be killed. So Joab assigned Uriah to a spot close to the city wall where he knew the enemy's strongest men were fighting. And when the enemy soldiers came out of the city to fight, Uriah the Hittite was killed along with several other Israelite soldiers. And let's fast forward to verses 26 through 27. It says, when Uriah's wife, when Bathsheba heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. Of course she did. The man who raped her had just murdered her husband, destroyed her family. She mourned for him. And when the period of mourning was over, David sent for her and brought her to the palace, and she became one of his wives. Then she gave birth to a son. But the Lord was greatly displeased with what David had done. Of course the Lord was. And and what happened is, guys, David was punished, as anybody who committed any of those crimes should be. If you committed any of those crimes, you should be thrown in jail for the rest of your life, okay? But David was king, so he couldn't be thrown in jail, so God punished him a different way. God actually didn't allow his son to live. God took David's newborn son to heaven, and this crushed David crushed David, but it led David to repentance, and he asked God to forgive him, and he did. God did forgive David, but here's the thing. Here's what I want us to focus in on. From this point on, there's a shift in David's life. He's no longer doing these mighty works of God. He's no longer being used by God in the incredible ways that he used to be. He's forgiven, and one day we're going to meet David in heaven. He's there, He's forgiven, but he's not the same David. And y'all, I believe the reason for this is because David never truly found freedom from his yesterdays. David had a bad case of yesterday-itis. I mean, he really screwed up. Maybe some of you guys watching this have really screwed up. I guarantee you probably not screwed up as bad as David. He had a bad case of yesterday-itis, and he never found healing from it. And y'all, Satan, I believe Satan used this against David. I believe from looking at the rest of David's story in Scripture that Satan kept bringing reminders into David's life to oppose David from ever being the old David again, to oppose David from ever walking into God's full plan for his life again, to oppose David from ever being used by God in a mighty way again. Because David, as you read the rest of David's story, which we're not going to, but you can go read on, but... 
David actually becomes a terrible father. He has really a, a dysfunctional family. If you think you've got crazy kids, you should read about David's kids. David has uh, uh, one son who rapes his daughter, who rapes his sister. And then David has another son who kills another son of his. And then David has another son who tries to kill him. So David's got some extremely dysfunctional children. And just because I know how Satan works, I imagine that David was about to do something great for the kingdom of God again. I imagine that David was about to walk into the path that God has laid out for him again. But any time that he would try to do that, I imagine Satan would put a DeLorean in his path. Any time that he would do that, Satan would put a DeLorean. So, for example, his uh, son rapes his daughter. And, of course, this crushes David, but I imagine this was a DeLorean for David. I imagine this took David right back to the moment where he raped Bathsheba. And all that guilt and all that pain started flooding back. And then when David had uh, a son that killed another son, I imagine Satan used this as a DeLorean to take David back in time. To when he killed Uriah. So David could never walk fully into the path that God laid out for him because he had a bad case of yesterday-itis. And Satan, the opposer, knew this about David because he studied David like he studies us all. And he used it against him. I want to I tell you another story. This is the second guy that we're talking about. And this is a guy named Paul. Um, Paul who, by the way, formerly was known as Saul, but God later would change his name. Paul was a horrible person. Paul made more mistakes and worse mistakes than David did. Paul would persecute and torture and imprison and even kill Christians. Paul hated Jesus, and he hated Jesus' followers, and he did all he could to stop Jesus' followers from being the church of Jesus Christ. But Paul goes on to meet Jesus. He finds Jesus, and he repents, and he asks God for forgiveness for all his sins. And because God is faithful and just to forgive any and all sins, he does. He does forgive Paul. But Paul doesn't stay still. He actually goes on to do incredible, mind-blowing things for the kingdom of God. He actually goes on to walk fully into God's plan for his life, even after these horrible sins that he committed. He goes on to plant a ton of churches. He goes on to be one of the main leaders in the early church. He goes on to write the majority of what we now call the New Testament. And without God using Paul the way that he did, we probably would not have church the way that we have it today. So we have David, who was used by God, sinned in a big way, asked forgiveness, but was no longer used by God the way he used to be. And then we have Paul, who sinned and asked for forgiveness, and then goes on to be used by God more than, he, more than he had ever been used in his entire life. Both guys really screwed up. Both guys really dropped the ball. Both guys asked for forgiveness, but only one found true freedom from his yesterday. Only one took the foothold away from the enemy. Only one found healing from his yesterday itis. And why is that? What is the difference between David and Paul? The difference is, y'all, listen closely, the difference is Paul confessed his sin, not just to God, but he also confessed his sins to others. Y'all, the Bible is really cool in the sense that you can also uh, read other people's mail. (laughs) And if you're nosy like me, that's awesome. A lot of the New Testament is, is letters written from people to churches or groups of Christians, And most of the New Testament is Paul writing letters to his community, to fellow believers. And listen to just a couple of times in Paul's letters where he confesses his sins to these groups of people. This is 1 Timothy 13 through 15. Paul says, hey, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ in my insolence, I persecuted his people. But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, and anyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And listen to what Paul says to this this other believer. He says, and I am the worst of them all. How vulnerable is that of Paul to do? Listen to Galatians 1, 13 through 14. This is Paul again. He says, you know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion, how violently I persecuted God's church. 
I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for traditions of my ancestors. So these are just two examples of how Paul confesses to other believers, to his community, about his past sins. But he also confesses his current sins to believers. Listen to Romans 7, 14 through 20. Paul says, hey, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good, so I am not the one doing wrong, and it's the sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me. That is my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong, and it's the sin living in me that does it. These are just a few examples, y'all, of Paul being open and being real and being vulnerable and confessing his sins to his community, to other believers. And y'all, listen to me. It's really important that you understand the difference between David and Paul. That is why Paul found freedom from his yesterdays. That is why Paul found freedom and David didn't. That is how Paul found healing from his yesterday-itis, and David never did. David just confessed his sins to God, and that brought David forgiveness. But Paul confessed his sins to God, and that brought him forgiveness. And he also confessed his sins to other people, to his community. And that brought him healing. That brought him freedom. And you may be thinking, oh, Brandon, that's blasphemous what you're saying. Are you saying that God isn't enough? Are you saying, Brandon, that God can't forgive you and God can't heal you and God can't set you free? No, I'm not saying that. God can absolutely do those things, but listen, he won't because that's not the way he's designed it. Listen to James 5.16. It says, confess your sins. Does that say confess your sins to God? No, it says confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. If Listen, if you confess your sins to God, you are forgiven. But have you ever noticed how even after you ask God for forgiveness, you're still, you still live in, in that guilt. There's still that guilt that lingers. You know God has forgiven you, but you still feel unworthy. You know God has forgiven you, but you still feel like you shouldn't go to church. You still feel like you shouldn't read the Bible. You still feel like you shouldn't pray like God doesn't even want to hear from you. You still feel like you shouldn't go to a small group or pull yourself in. You, sh you still feel like you shouldn't be serving. That, y'all, is yesterday-itis. <laughs> you have a condition of yesterday-itis, and, and that is the guilt that our very real enemy plays on. That is the guilt that Satan uses to oppose you and to keep you from doing what God has called you to do with your life. That is the guilt that the enemy uses to keep you from taking the next step in your walk with Jesus. How do you find healing from that guilt? You confess your sins to each other, guys. Confess your sins to God, of course, but then the next step is to confess your sins to each other. Listen to me. You need community. You need community. I want you to type in the comment section right now, I need it. You need it. You need community. When we talk about plugging into small groups and all that stuff, it's not just because, oh, we like small groups. It's kind of our thing. No, it's because we know that you need it. We all do. We need community. You need people in your life that you can be open and honest and vulnerable with. And because then and only then will you find healing. Then and only then will you find freedom from your yesterdays. The devil, y'all, Satan, our enemy, our opposer, he will hold your yesterday over your head, but only for as long as you let him. You have the power to take that leverage away from our enemy. And that is to confess your sins to each other. Is it awkward? Absolutely. Is it awkward to go to a group of people and say that you struggle with porn or you struggle with lust or you struggle with alcohol or whatever? Yeah, that's awkward. It's awkward. Is it hard? Yes. Is it painful? Yes. Is it mainly and macho? Absolutely not. But is it necessary to grow in your faith? Yes. Is it necessary to kick the enemy out of your life? Yes. Is it necessary for you to find healing and freedom? Absolutely. Let me close, let me close with this. Um, 
my wife, Michaela, and I, we're very different. And I think that's what makes us work. Like we have the whole opposites attract thing going for us. But we're different in a lot of ways. And one of the ways we're different is our bathroom setup. Like we have to use two different bathrooms. Michaela uses our master bathroom. I typically use our guest bathroom. And the reason is because if you walk into Michaela's shower, you will see a massive amount of different bottles. Like, she's got like 10 different kinds of shampoos, 10 different kinds of conditioner, 10 different kinds of body wash, 10 different bottles of shower gel. And I don't even know what shower gel is, but it's in there. It's tons of it. And then you go to my shower, and you see one bottle. One bottle. Man, this bottle's huge. But it's got everything you could want. It's got, it's got shampoo. It's got your conditioner. It's got your body wash. It's got your toothpaste. It's got your shaving cream. All of it in one. Here's my point. Y'all, you cannot be two in one. You cannot be. You're either, you're either conditioner or shampoo, but you're not both. You're either living in your past or you're living in your future, living for your future. You're not both. You can't live in your past and live in the future that God has in store for you at one time. You can't. In order In order to walk in the path and the calling that God has laid out for you. Because listen, God, the creator of the universe, I don't know if you guys know this, but the one who created the universe, he knows you, he loves you, and he has a purpose and a plan for you. But in order to walk in that purpose and that plan, you have to find freedom from your yesterdays. You have to take that leverage, take that foothold away from the enemy so that you can walk in that purpose and that calling for your life and do all of the incredible, mind-blowing things that I truly believe God has called you to do. But you got to find freedom from your past to do that. You can't have both. So what I want to encourage you guys to do, find someone. Find someone. Have them. Pray with them. Talk with them. Find community. Find a, find a small group. If you're watching this and you don't go to Revolution Church, plug yourself into a church and do it quick. Plug yourself into a church, a Bible-believing church. Find community that you can be real with, that you can be open with, that you can be honest with, and that you can confess your sins to, your past sins, your current sins, and your future sins. Because that is how you find healing from yesterday-itis. And if you want to do what God has called you to do with your life, you have to find that freedom. So find community. You need it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word Thank you for how real and how relevant and how powerful your word always has been, always will be. Father, I pray for every single person that's watching right now. If they don't have it already, God, I pray that you would put people in their life, put community in their life that they can be real and honest and vulnerable with, people that they can confess their sins to. And God, I pray that you would give each person watching this the courage to do that because that's not easy and it's awkward and it's hard and it's painful and it's tough and it's not manly or whatever. So Father, I pray that you give them the courage and the strength to be vulnerable and to confess their sins to each other. Father, as you know, this is one of the main problems in the modern church is that we're afraid to be vulnerable. So Father, I pray that you give these people the courage to be vulnerable so that they can find healing from the yesterdays and so they can move on in the plan and the calling that you have laid out before them. Father, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys for watching. Have a great week.